first the team before I jump into the official PowerPoint presentation we have uh, prepared for this very hour. On the top left in my screen is Tatiana. Just wave your hands. I can see the is... presentation. No, no, no. I haven't switched it on. So therefore, oh, first mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, in, introduce our team here from the side of the TO Delft. Tatiana, part of our team. She's okay. the one who deals with you and your questions on a daily basis. Then we have Uli Knark. Just wave your hand. Uh, the mastermind uh, of this course and uh, my fellow um, traveler on this little uh, journey that we have put together in the camper van. We have uh, Tilman Klein over there. He is actually my boss, also partner in crime uh, with Uli and myself uh, with our seven years of endeavor as a facade consultant, Imagine Envelope. And uh, I'm very happy to also welcome Bea. Bea, wave your hand. She is our content manager, learner, assistant, and in principle, the one who kicks our ass on a daily basis before we were able to put this course online. So therefore, she, she deserved a applause already up to now. And um, myself, Marcel Bilo, I'm the second uh, crazy one sitting next to Uli. Um, joining this and uh, be your host for today. Oh, my mouse is uh, lost, my fingers. So I will switch over to a short presentation we have prepared to explain a little bit the network we are dealing or working within to introduce ourselves a little bit more, followed by some advertisement of other content we have created and uh, would like to invite you to. And then we will jump into a couple of questions we have received from you to start a discussion and we would also like to invite you to raise new questions join the discussion mm -hmm. as much as you like and um, we will end up with a couple of um, discussions that we can already do based on the hand-ins we got from the sketch drive about various projects and questions that has arised from that but let's first start with this I will share my screen. That would be PowerPoint. Share. And then you should be able to see the very first slide for SAR design and engineering complexity made simple. Is that right? Raise your finger. Perfect. So who we are? This team. We are from is called the Architectural Facades and Products Research Group. It's part of the TU Delft. We are all within the Department of Architectural Engineering and Technology. So in principle, we are the technology guys of the TU Delft's architecture faculty. And um, we formed within this is, uh, two chairs. It's the chair of Tilman Klein, Building Product Innovation, and Uli's chair, the chair Design of Construction. A couple of people. A couple of groups there's more and uh, always changing due to the uh, number of phd researchers we have involved and uh, it's an ongoing network uh, you already we already uh, introduced holger strauss who was also with us and of course uh, will ever be oh there was a change in that yeah and uh, hamza anna and yeah Ivaro precisely also, which are yeah, now precisely. in the group huh? Yeah, and we also see Tatiana, of course, and uh, that's perfect. So the research group is divided into different topics. We have within the two chairs, it's about facades, multifunctional smart facades, for instance. In here, we have uh, been dealing and still do within strategies for refurbishment in facades. It's either on residential or um, office, office buildings. We have uh, a huge focus on circular building products and circularity in general that we are dealing with. Tillman is um, head of the Circular Built Environment Hub, a huge group of researchers within the TU Delft who is uh, dealing with all topics from all different scales within circularity. Then we have an integrated design approach that is uh, product development that uh, merges different functions and uh, design in general. And we also have a human-centered design that is um, yeah, I'm honestly not that aware of Tillman. Help me, human-centered design. Who does human-centered design? Is it uh, Olga? Alessandra. Oh. Alessandra. Ah, that's a precisely. It's that's a new. A new uh, yeah, it's a new topic from our side. 
And um, we are all dealing within and have actually founded the European network, which is a network that spreads all over Europe and um, puts um, people and experts within the industry together who are uh, active within the field of education and also research. So you can see there's um, from uh, Great Britain, Germany, Switzerland, um, Spain, Italy, uh, Portugal, uh, Delft, of course, and also Turkey. We have a huge network of researchers. We meet on a date, on a uh, regular base on facade symposiums we are organizing within this circle. So therefore, there's a huge group who has exchange um, we are the website, we are the platform, but also we are uh, several meetings we do over the year. And um, we not only talk about, but we will also write about, and we are quite happy that we have a lots of publications. The most scientific in this case is the Facade Journal, the Journal of Facade Design and Engineering, but there's also um, educative books like the Principles of Constructions, uh, where we talk about various topics. Um, we have the Imagine book series, it's more like a coffee table book for your inspiration. So if you are interested, um, Google, almost all of the um, publications we are doing are now open access and accessible for free. And uh, I'd like to ask Tillman to talk a little bit more about our online activities, where we would like to invite you also, if you're interested to follow these topics. Yeah, just just very briefly, because you're obviously interested in, in lifelong learning and our online offers. We have a, a bit more to show you. Um, this is a, um, some courses about circularity um, and they are, they are different formats. Um, the lower ones are MOOCs or massive open online courses like this one. Uh, one is an introduction to circular economy. Then uh, engineering design for circular economy. That's not per se building related. And again, an introduction to circular economy. And the top ones are more um, um, built environment related. This is, these are uh, profits, the circular building products for sustainable built environment. That's a course over five weeks for professionals. So it's a bit closer guided than a MOOC. Um, then there's a special circularity strategies for sustainable region development and a new course format, which is an expert workshop starting next week on 9th of June. And from there on, we have it uh, following three weeks, always on a Thursday from two to five. And um, it's, so it's a three hour session with uh, lectures from experts from other disciplines. So from sustainable supply chain management, circular economy <coughs> and so on. So with lots of interactions. So if you're interested, you, you find that offer uh, yeah, on the TU Delft online learning site very welcome. Uh, send us an email, sign up, and uh, hopefully we see you next week. That's it from my side. Thank you very much, Tillman. That might be a lot. We will also share this presentation within the, surf, the platform of the MOOC. We may also add a couple of links. For instance, there's Facade World that also gives a good overview of all of our activities and uh, actions products and projects. And of course, please also feel free to interact with us on LinkedIn. There's a couple of us who are more or less active on that, but uh, it's always, um, we are always open to increase our network and uh, will also answer questions if we have the time for that. So sometimes with a little bit of a delay, but uh, please, whatever um, burns under your nails, if we say in German, um, let us know, don't hesitate to contact us. Let's jump into the topic of today's um, session, web yeah. session, the webinar. So we have, um, there's one picture more. We've already introduced uh, Bea, Tatiana, Uli and myself as the heads that run this MOOC. And um, <laughs> it's a very cold jump into the next one. That's already the very first question we got from Anna. And um, I'd like to read it out loud and then we can start the discussion. So please, Uli and Tatiana, for instance, um, start first. I will also join, but I'd like to have this also as an open discussion. So whenever you would like to engage and also um, wanna add to the discussion, please raise your hands or make yourself heard. I'd start reading out uh, this. 
During the course, several elements to consider when defining a facade have been presented. Principles, systems, and materials. I would like to open a discussion on how the facade doctors and participants engage with these different elements during the design process. For example, we could start by selecting a material for its appearance and then look at other elements. It's not a question. It's, it's, it's not a question. No, it's, it's a, a discussion. It's, it's an a open discussion. And I fully support this proposition. This, yeah. uh, this is a clear, clear attitude to start a design. You have an, uh, an idea for a certain material related to a function of a building or a location of a building, and then develop from that material choice you made the the facade um, the building itself the entire design so i i fully support this yes this would be a clear way to do what 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 i directly thought about is a little bit like the chicken and the egg um, yeah, true. problem sometimes you have um, a company who asks you to make a facade out of their material we had, for instance, workshops within a company who make uh, a recycling product um, out of natural fibers and uh, they ask about the possibilities to use their material for a cladding. Then the material is given and then you look into available sizes, the properties of the material, and then you try to be as creative as possible in order to make sure that this building, uh, that the facade cladding can be made out of that. Yeah. On the other I, hand, I, I, it can I, I, also be totally uh, uh, the opposite. Exactly. And if you ask me, I will say this discussion is perfect to start this week that we are going to talk about complex projects. And actually, some of these complex projects tackle this, this topic, actually, how, right. how the right. material, how the material is used in completely different ways that we didn't imagine before, like glass, for example. Or, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, the, 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 the projects which we show, um, so they say this decision for um, a solid glass structure. Um, the videos are not yet shown, Tatiana. Yeah, right? this, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm supposed to not exp express too much. No, no, no. So, it is no, the, the glass houses the are already okay. already published, isn't it? Well, then, then yeah, at yeah. that point, this architect was having the question of how can I get it maximum transparent, looking like bricks, which is a material decision, and then the design and engineering starts. And Carola, which, uh, which is the architect of the high rise in Rotterdam, she had a clear view of uh, a vision of the about material. how the, 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 the natural stone has to look like for a building. So she started exactly with this kind of position. Well, I wouldn't say she started the design with this position, but uh, because the design, say, of the building itself may also have different origins. But um, the material was clearly, and her vision on the material was clearly in, in, in an aspect um, to tackle it. Exactly. And actually, the decision making process of the architect and the engineers was based on the properties of the material and what their intentions were on how to use this material. So I, I, and I would say like a lot of engineers through this MOOC and I, I use something that I learned from myself, uh, a lot of, of the facade engineers said like never say no. You have to explore all the possibilities of the material, look for the professionals, but always look for the possibilities. And when that is when the innovation starts, and then when out of the both thinking also starts. And I think it's a lot of, of the projects that we're presenting in this particular week are actually an example of this specific statement. What's also interesting, if we look back at the um, Fanelle uh, factory in Rotterdam, we already had shared that video, I think. Yes. That is from a time yeah, where facade systems were quite limited. So you see that the facade and window profiles are actually made out of um, standardized steel profiles. So it was totally um, a choice of the designer and the engineers and the architect to shape that facade based on available products, which are in this case combined in almost a new inventive way. Nowadays, we have the freedom and also the headache in order to choose from the various systems there are on the market. Back then, there was no choice like that, so they had to be more inventive. Exactly. But, but maybe we can ask Anna, if she's still here, if we have been able to answer that question or talk about what was your um, start with that? Um, have, have we... Well, I think point. for me, there is not like um, uh, 
a right uh, way to start, like uh, the one that I set up as example was, you know, one perspective. Uh, so it was more like to see different points of views from different countries, not taking advantage that we have people from all over around the world and to see yeah. um, which was their criteria. Like, uh, for example, it could be that the thermal performance of the building, it's something that, uh, no, it's a really relevant aspect. So you start by deciding how this facade system uh, needs to perform and then selecting the available materials, etc. So yeah, for me, it was more, more like um, to get to know different perspectives from, from all over around the world and, and see what people were thinking. So I think you've answered uh, the question, like um, but, but actually, but if someone I, I, wants to participate, like, yeah. No, but I, I, I also saw that uh, within in the skits, right, within the assignments, that example specific happened to one of your examples, right? That you could identify different construction systems and how the, the construction system were different in a different location from you. And mm -hmm. it was like how they uh, built the brick and when it was the timber uh, construction uh, system were used. Maybe you could uh, uh, just uh, describe a little bit more that example, if you remember the example. Because uh, I remember yeah, it's, that a, it's a ventilated facade system. And I think the discussion was because uh, the structural element that is placed between the different slabs of that of the building, um, yeah. it's a, a load bearing brick that it's typically used in Spain that we call it Hero. So mm -hmm. the discussion was like, for example, is, is this kind of load bearing system really necessary? And yeah, like in terms of like, it's really practical because the construction workers in Spain like really know how to build with this kind of um, method, let's say, but then they wanted to build the, um, a uh, ventilated facade, which uh, it's currently being uh, more implemented in Spain, but traditionally it wasn't. So it's like this kind of mix of um, weird system, let's say, um, that I find it quite interesting. I don't know if this was the kind of um, answer that you were expecting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. Yeah. There was also yeah, from Lu okay. Luciana a, um, a good point. From a sustainable point of view, I think we need to think about the local climate and the context. A glass facade may not be the most efficient system for warm countries, for example. True. Totally right. True. So, that is true. Totally true. right. That's also what I covered within my PhD. It was a little bit about the stupidity in using glass high rises all over the world. So first think about the facade, uh, think about the climate and then choose the facade accordingly. It doesn't make sense uh, to um, place high rises fully glazed in a very hot uh, desert climate. I think that covers the first um, question or introduction to a dis yeah. open discussion very well. Thank you, I have the second Anna, one. for the question. Yeah, thanks. From T Valencia, we have uh, Dear Facade Doctors, IGU, Insulated Glass Units Improvement. You mentioned that the life expectancy of an IGU is about 20 years. I've experienced this problem and it's very expensive and not good in terms of circularity. True. Is there a way to improve it? Maybe better ceiling, smaller windows or a better frame? Yeah, that's actually a huge topic that we are dealing right now within the Netherlands. We have uh, circularity yeah. as a driver right now. And um, a couple of students, as also uh, researchers, have already started to think about the improvements of IGUs in or towards a more circular product. If we look yeah. at the um, development of IGUs, we see that the U value increased. So the insulation has been on the driving factor. We have now very highly insulated glass units, but the more they were developed towards energy savings, the less they were able to be recycled. And nowadays, but a single piece of mm. glass that has been used in architecture can be recycled in architecture. They will be downcycled into yeah, first uh, cola bottles, then wine bottles, and then beer bottles from white to green to brown. And they end up maybe as uh, insulating foam, uh, glass foam at the very end. So therefore there is research going on. Um, it's very difficult. We had students of mine developing this idea and they thought about having them mechanically clamped together that you can 
take part, t take them apart. That is all difficult over, yeah, they have to at least perform for 20 years. Otherwise, every new system you develop have to be better than the ones we use today. Air tightness is, so is, is a serious problem. So clamping it, I'm not yeah. sure. Um, that's say an, an yeah. issue. And then a better sealing, sealant. Now, yeah, if you may be able to get it off, peeled off of the glass, that may be an, an, an issue. Smaller windows, I wouldn't say. Um, the pumping effect, so the inner air pressure of the cavity versus the outer air pressure becomes more problem if the glass plate and the, the window is smaller than it's larger, because then the pumping ex effect itself uh, starts to happen more, which means that the mm -hmm. sealant is more under pressure. And yeah. um, starts to starts to, um, to to lag faster. So I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't expect that to really to help. I think the main direction to go would be maybe in finding a solution to get off the silicon from the um, IGU in a say proper way that the quality of the glass um, ends up being 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 used to the same level. Next step to that, all the coatings which we add in the IGUs, yeah. like um, uh, the ones which are see, preventing sun to get in, or the ones which uh, help to keep the, uh, the temperature the um, uh, temperature inside. These coatings are small um, metal coatings of uh, a tenth of a millimeter, and they also are difficult to get rid of in uh, the um, uh, recycling processes, which then makes it again difficult to make the same quality of glass out of it. So no answer, but a lot more problems. Yeah. Um, and do you do you think that the research will be in, then not in the system, but more in the materials itself that are used to produce the IGU, or will it be like the overall the, the innovation will be uh, both <laughs> all, system all free. and materials. All, yeah. all free. So it will be the material research, it will be the system research, but it will also be an alternative system. So making yeah. a triple glazed system with an say inner layer out of a foil instead of a glazing makes it yeah. less material and uh, by that may be less complex in uh, you know, the waste, waste management. But uh, again, this yeah. is not, um, yeah, it's on all three levels. What I've seen is, uh, I don't know exactly if they have used that, it was, but it was under the discussion from a New York building Thomas Auer was involved in, I think, wasn't it the um, oh, very famous built tower in New York where they take out the existing glass units, set up a local workshop and uh, remanufactured the glazing downstairs and then put them up again. Um, this is also a concept I've, I've heard um, another time here in a discussion in the Netherlands, but it's very tricky. It's kind of like, um, yeah, it is. Um, it creates problems on all sides, and the problem right now, and especially within the industry, the glass industry is not interested in that. They are oh. they are set up in a way that they oh. are able to produce glass as cheap as possible, mm. and IGUs are very cheap. They are able to mass customize it from various layers, coatings. You can glass is so mm. um, incredible, customizable for all the various um, uh, demands. And this is made so cheap in principle that, um, yeah, the question is uh, within circular approaches, is there still value and money in the business? If it's so cheap that it is most likely, yeah, the, every, every other solution is three times more expensive. Yeah, it's the question, who's the I'm driving sorry. force? Marcel, but uh, say this industry um, really faces um, uh, uh, appearing changes. So um, you're absolutely right. This is an issue they're, they're currently discussing intensively. Yeah. They need to, they need to, and they're saying boiling glass mean, need, needs a lot of energy. Yeah. And doing yeah. this by gas yeah. is obviously not, uh, not, uh, not, say, the long lasting strategy. Yeah, but I've already within the last four years got two official negative uh, um, answers not interested uh, at all right now because we've the already industry. worked on with yeah, yeah i will not name anyone any companies yeah. but um, they've they have um, yeah that was the official statement back then to, to me or to us <laughs> it's 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 a problem i think within a couple of years if we are forced by law that a certain amount of uh, building products have to be then they exactly. also have to react yeah. 
All right. Maybe the second uh, topic, ventilated yeah. facades. I'm a little bit uh, unsure about which project we talk about, but let's see if we can figure it out. I really like the concrete prefabricated facade example, but I would like to know more about its thermal conductivity and how could I justify this investment in terms of years to recover it? Could you compare it with a simple aluminum ventilated facade? I, I think we're talking about uh, the Darmstadt project. I guess so, where we interviewed Jens. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When you did the, the lab. Yeah, well, I have to say um, we, we took that project because um, I quite like the appearance of this facade. It's um, um, uh, ventilated, um, solid facade structure with an outer layer of uh, concrete. Um, but I also have to say um, it's a bit of a special facade, so it's not a just normal ventilated facade with an outer layer of concrete. It also has an, uh, an um, capillary solar thermal system, which actually is vented by myself, side note, um, which is integrated, which um, harvests energy, stores it, and then delivers it at the inside, at the inner structure. So in that respect, it's not a very typical um, uh, cladding facade but um, yeah I, I like it a lot because it has to say certain certain attitude outer layer of concrete cavity insulation inner structure let's say the principal setup yeah but the conductivity is also because of the aerated concrete yeah it is yeah. already insulating concrete so therefore that's a another, very that's, a, that's another part of the story yeah right so therefore it's a very lightweight concrete that becomes mm -hmm um the insulation that's what i especially like about this product beside the active parts of the capillary tubes that are able to con um to trap um and collect the the heat or the energy but it's a mono material it's a little bit like sugar you can have sugar as a powder you can have sugar as um, the spider web from the trade fairs you, you can have it um, yeah. yeah precisely it's a very porous material he yeah, makes a yeah, mess yeah. on his desk so yeah. therefore <laughs> if you have a mono material that is from hard on the outside concrete <laughs> load bearing shell very porous in the middle by using aerated concrete and becoming hard again on the inside you have almost a yeah or you have a sandwich material which is a gradient material but a mono material so if you grind them up at the very end you end up with concrete that can also be recycled in various ways we can have a discussion about uh, concrete well. itself yeah. that is well but um, in this case it's already a, a mono material approach and therefore um, aluminium for instance um, may um, also have difficulties within the overall life cycle if you um, yeah, have a look already where it's produced if it's only Icelandic aluminium which is totally, uh, yeah, which is totally based on uh, regenerative natural energy sources. Then we have a different topic, but yeah, uh, yeah. also aluminium is very, very energy consuming um, to make. Uh, I have a question for to the project. Would you describe the project as a trump wall solution or an active no. insulation? <clears throat> no, 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 no. It's no. a passive insulation. Um, so the insulation itself, the concrete is passive. It's not activated. The activating is uh, happening with the uh, with the um, capillary the tubes. Ma ma uh, and yeah. it's only collecting energy. It's yeah. only it's oh, it's only collecting energy mm -hmm. from the outside, storing okay. it and delivering to the inside. But Holger, it also collects energy from the inside when it gets too hot, stores mm -hmm. it, and delivers mm -hmm. to the outside at night time. Okay, thank you. So it's, a, it's a heat it's a heat system. exchanger. It's a heat exchange. Yeah, it's a heat exchange. Exactly. Right. It's yeah, a mess on my desk now. <laughs> it's good yeah. to show how it works the material. Also, we have a discussion yeah. in the chat now with uh, Bolaji and Marcel about the IGUs. Uh, she wants to know how do you address the issue where you the IGU failure, where the IGU no longer performs. And uh, when that happens, the solution is typically a replacement. True. And I, she was wondering what the facade uh, team thinks in terms of discussion about circularity and how to improve that 
that part when the IGU fails, basically. In terms of regularity, what do you recommend will be the best solution? Yeah, I think we already tackled that in the answers earlier. There yeah. is no way yeah. of doing it. Right now, we have companies yeah. who claim they can recycle um, the glass in a way that they get rid of the coatings while burning it. Um, then you can use a higher value recycled glass. Um, if you can't find a company wherever you are that are able to collect and um, take your IGUs um, and put it back into a circle, to get a higher value out of that, I would recommend that. In the Netherlands, there is companies who start doing that. Um, yeah. The ideal situation is that companies call you and ask if they can buy the old IGUs from you because they have spotted that building to be demolished. Up to now, you have to pay for the waste that is transported yeah. off the site. So therefore, <laughs> there might be a change in that. Um, but um, the development of the IGU itself is still ongoing and I foresee a slow development into a circular um, approach. If you, if you Google uh, from the TU Delft's uh, repository, um, IGU circularity, you will find uh, uh, two graduation projects who tackled it, very first pioneers, both ideas, I'm not that convinced but it's a very first start that also this uh, also shows all the problems we have to deal with. So yeah, not great. solved, no answer. Yeah, yeah not solved, precisely, no. <laughs> precisely. Research project, okay, let's go for the next question. Precisely, so hi professors. In the process of architectural design, the reserved installation space of curtain walls is often involved. For example, we generally reserve 300 millimeters for glass curtain wall, and 200 millimeter for aluminum curtain wall. But some curtain wall builders will have different requirements. Now, some emerging technologies are applied to building facades, such as building integrated PVs. What restrictions and requirements will the introduction of new technologies bring to facade design? Now, that's a very interesting topic. It's impossible to answer, yeah. myself. Precisely. <laughs> um, can you define can which country? <laughs> Precisely, Christian. Um, are you here, maybe? Chris, Let's that, that, see. I, I think I saw him. That there. would be actually very interesting to have a little bit further clarification on that. Otherwise, I can only mention, for instance, um, within our book, mm -hmm. Principles of Facade Constructions, we have um, shared the grammar of facade types from a single layer to a double layered hybrid ventilated double facades and also unitized facade systems which are um, built in a way that they have hybrid components in that so therefore the technical installation like decentralized um, mechanical ventilations have already been integrated like the post tower in bonn German project by Helmut Jahn, which is the pioneer of facade integrated decentralized systems. They took the space underneath and within the raised floor a little bit to the inside of the facade and followed by that, for instance, Capricorn, Gattermann Schossig, uh, Düsseldorf, the one with the red enameled uh, glass, which is uh, in our book presented, which has it integrated within the facade. We have seen that the facade um, was used the, the overall uh, cavity to encapsulate these mechanical integrate uh, these mechanical ventilation into uh, units also being further developed by companies like Colt or others who make them fit within that envelope um, and I think BEPVs so building integrated PV panels are not that thick in principle you can integrate them already within your standard IGUs so I do not think that yeah. you need to extend the cavity in general for integrating PV. Uh, I will say depend on the system but we also a uh, question related with this specific topic from Ms. Mbet Alemo uh, as, is asking what is the future of using photovoltaic on facade? Uh, do you have like uh, some inter some examples that where maybe we could also tackle now where you can see some of these examples how people or designers are using photovoltaics in facades now? I have a twofold answer. 
Um, the one answer is um, in, say, our German system, uh, we are facing that uh, um, some researchers say that at least 10% of our building surface existing needs to be covered with PV to somehow deal with the energy request we are facing. 10% existing is an enormous amount, kind of impossible to, 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 to solve that. But that's a, that's a clear statement. And the other statement um, is more a personal one. Um, uh, building integrated PV is existing since some 20 years. I have the books in the shelf showing this, and uh, I still don't see this happening in a huge amount, which is a kind of strange. Um, um, then there seems to be some kind of more emotional argument for not doing than a pure technical argument. We learn okay. by research that um, uh, even the, um, the morning afternoon orientation of a building, the PV is maybe less efficient than perfectly being oriented to south or north, depending on where you are the hemisphere, but still delivers enough energy to um, overcome the peaks, which we at some regions already have with, uh, the, with the normal PV. So it even makes energy-wise sense. So there's no, no real technical argument. It feels more yeah. like an, uh, an, an emotional argument. Yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it aesthetic. They can do all colors you want, but somehow it still doesn't fly, which is a bit strange. I don't have a clear answer why MPV doesn't work that perfect. But I think now is actually coming to the point that uh, uh, designers and uh, governments actually would like us to do that. If you ask me currently in the research project I'm working currently in SNARE, yeah. that uh, we are working together with some companies and some with un universities that are actually to try to establish, which is like the old optimal uh, uh, area of use uh, PV panels in order to generate zero energy buildings. So everyone, and now we have a big team working towards, okay, how to actually add these PV panels in an efficient way and uh, uh, kind of aesthetical and actually try to make these zero energy buildings in the old buildings, because now the, the idea of what Europe is working towards now is how to create zero energy buildings, but from the old buildings, not new ones, but the refurbishment projects to be zero energy. Now. And they are trying to integrate more and more these uh, photovoltaic, uh, photovoltaic panels in an efficient way in the facade. What's also interesting is that um, within Tillman's approach with Juan for the leasing facade, True. Um, a concept in which you don't own the facade anymore, but you pay a monthly fee for it. They have integrated PV uh, in a lot of um, these concepts because it might be the interest of the company who rents out the facade to earn additional money with that. So that might also be an interesting approach while the ownership of the building and so is a little bit different. but. We've also worked within our Dutch research uh, group for um, the PV group in Delft. And they also said, guys, we can do almost everything. We can make them flexible, translucent, transparent, every color you choose. Why the hell aren't architects using it? Um, yeah. There is a problem, and especially yeah. that lies in the uh, clients. They try to make, yeah, there's still a very uh, a budget limit. And if you're not forced by the government to have at least a certain amount or percentage of re re renewable energy, there's no, yeah, there's no interest in that. They would like to have, for instance, some um, comfort uh, performances uh, of the users later for the people who rent the offices is higher priority uh, than, for instance, uh, creating renewable energies. Sure. Uh, we oh, have no now solution. another. Now we have like another question in the chat. Uh, dear facade doctors, regarding standards, what do you believe that will be a trend to become a standard in terms of techniques and systems? Uh, there are new systems being developed every day, but do you think there is any element or principle that will become a must? Anything that you feel we, uh, that will be forbidden? <laughs> For global, 
Yeah, that's uh, globally. I I did a study in my PhD about vernacular architecture. There is three big books of um, Benjamin, who traveled the world uh, and collected all the different uh, solutions for each of the different climates and countries. That book will still remain in 500 years because every market, sure. every climate is different. There is no standard. Um, in general, we see that we are forced to use less energy. We might be forced to use materials that can be kept in the loop. So therefore we have a yeah. common sense, but standards in general, it's kind of like just here we in Europe, when we travel by car over 20 hours, we cross, the, we cross over to Europe and you see so many different regional solutions to the same problem. This, there's no standard uh, possible. Not universal. I always say they will depend on the location and country, as you said yeah. before. Yeah. Marcel, okay. next page. Next page. Oh, that's a long one. Yeah. Um, maybe I can shut, cut a little bit shorter by... Um, we're talking about seismic events, explosions, something like that. And in addition to double facade functions, mm -hmm. is it possible to use advanced and control devices instead of brackets and conventional connections to control the facade movement? And facade works as a control system for the primary structure. Um, I'd like to cut it in two parts. Um, Precisely. So, uh, Mm -hmm. yes, uh, controlling yes. the movements of facades. There's actually a nice research ongoing in uh, Stuttgart. Um, uh, Professor Menges and Professor Sobek, Professor Blandini, they're investigating movable parts or active systems, structure systems for buildings, and they're now also transferring this to facades. So in case of, say, in wind impact, the facade somehow stiffens for a certain time, and then becomes more loose again to um, to to adapt. That's um, say the value. The main reason why they do it, the value would be that uh, you use less structural materials and you stiffen it exactly that moment when you need it at the situation you need it. It's in principle four guys holding a, to a tent while it storms very heavily. Yeah. While you can let yeah. loose when the wind when, is when, gone when, when, when well that's uh, that's a nice comic of uh, of, uh, of that research i will use it to that at some point so that's um, that's uh, the uh, the um, uh, the one facade and then dealing with the primary structure in the facade now nah, that's a principle one if you call it facade we actually expect that this is not primary structure if you make it a wall then it becomes primary structure which also is the outer envelope which you may then name facade but then the primary structure is uh, is in, in the lead um and th then the, the this component being the primary structure um yeah it takes takes the load of the building yeah often we refer to facades as the curtain wall systems which has the separation from the load bearing uh, structure of the building and the cladding the envelope that seals the outer skin so therefore yeah, it has to be. Uh, and you, we also want to have that uh, separation at certain points where the facade is, uh, yeah, can actually be damaged and the primary structure of the building is still intact. Yeah. If you, if you want to know more about Patrick Teufel also did uh, oh, yeah. research on smart beams that is now further developed from Zobeck and uh, Blandini that Uli mentioned. He already published uh, his PhD, I think, oh, 15, 20 years ago. I think this was the start, the start of that um, smart beam sort of um, active systems. System. Yeah. 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 I like the next question in the chat, which is asking uh, what to learn more about facades uh, than this course. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, visit our friends. Uh, I added here the European Facade Network in the in the chat. Visit our friends and their places. They do this education, and uh, that's part, also part why we why we visited them because it is European Facade Network, as Marcel um, um, addressed it, and that's where you're um, where you're able to study. But let's say in a typical normal study, so you go there in person, it take you two years, blah blah blah. Yeah, for me personally, I also um, 
I grew up and studied in Detmold, a very small university. You have maybe already seen the building uh, on the videos. Um, this is a very local. Uh, this is a very local university, and I learned a lot and the biggest share of my knowledge from books, but also from symposia. Nowadays, it's a little bit yeah. easier to join symposia due to the fact that they're often recorded. But whenever you can afford and be able to join a facade symposium and mingle in the groups after in the coffee table discussions and whatsoever, make yourself uh, known. Um, yeah. I was I was able to 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 join a couple of uh, facade symposiums in Germany and learned the network that way and was able to getting smarter and smarter because on a facade symposium most likely you will hear the latest news and the, the biggest failures which are now also documented uh, with a little delay in the facade journal so also make sure you um, read the journals ours is um, freely accessible we can also learn a lot from the facade MOOC we're doing is the basics of facades it's the equivalent of one EC in principle. That's what we teach our students, but it also goes beyond that when we discuss about their designs and so on. But there's a plethora of um, knowledge available already for free on the internet, being the proceedings and then proceedings of symposia, journals, and so on. On the facadeworld.com, we also share a lot of that um, next to the European Facade Network. I'd yeah. like to uh, I'd like to have the last yeah, question. Um, this is a kind of like a technical one. Facade doctors they talk about IGUs again. Um, what is the main factor we have to look at to choose small nine millimeter or larger sixty millimeter air gaps or the cavities within the two panes of glass? Finally, what is the maximum allowable air gap? You mean, Marcel? Yeah. In principle, convection. The, convection the conve we, we have a uh, the cavity in the glass. I would say 16, 18 millimeters should be maximum. Absolutely. When we start to increase the distance between, we start with a convection of air in between, which means we pump the heat yeah from the inside to the outside so we get a a, yeah, a heat roll sort of movement and um, it does not entirely um, uh, is based on the format or the thickness of the glasses but um, yeah that is also in uh, accordance to the glass manufacturers we should always contact them according to the local uh, to the climates and see because glasses are have the tendency to pump and therefore it might also infl influence how thick you are choosing the gap in between but um, making them too big doesn't help anymore second question related yeah. to laminated glass most standards recommend to use laminated glass for slope glazing skylights and doors yep what about vertical glazing? Isn't it recommended to um, um, recommended to, um, or uh, acceptable to use other glass types? And what is the risk for using other glass types on vertical glazing? Now, yeah, vertical glazing things fall down, so you actually have to um, um, vertical. Sorry, vertical glazing. Um, if it's not if it's not a barrier to stop you to fall down, there's a less regulations. And it depends very much on uh, the country you're dealing with. Uh, European setting for this is currently that we have different types of um, uh, positions of vertical glazing depending on what's the impact. Is there a balustrade or is there non-balustrade? If there's none, then a um, a human body of 100 kilo horizontal in one meter height should be able to impact that glass without breaking it. And the uh, second thing is uh, what happens with the glass falling down. And then there are different types of uh, regulations. I'm not actually sure about the numbers, but they're about four or five or something. And the most simple one is a private house. You actually don't expect that there's someone um, below the glass if it falls down. And the other one is a shopping mall where for surely you can expect that there are people. So there you have to take uh, um, that risk for the mm. vertical, uh, vertical glazes. So pretty much relies on is there an impact and where is, the, where is it used? Yeah, it's, uh, it's also it based on, on the traffic in the building. Yeah. Are you able, yeah. from which side are you able to go through or whatsoever? Um, 
There is um, also regional and uh, in every of the country uh, a law, a building code to that. Most likely they are um, they approach the problem from the same fact. The numbers may vary. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like I do, also during the examples that the that the students share in the sketch drive it was very interesting. Actually, how this approach was tackled from uh, different countries where you have to take in account earthquakes or uh, different kind of loads besides uh, wind load, yeah, like bomb, sand bomb load blast like is an, another kind of lo load which could be an issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 It pretty much varies from uh, from uh, location and say security concepts. Yeah. yeah. I would always, if you are in doubt, I would always go to the local glass industry. They have salesmen all over that helps architects, engineers, and designers in finding the right combination of glass. I honestly um, have planned plenty of buildings, but I would have never been able to do that without an expert on the glass side. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because it is such a huge variety that you will most likely be wrong. So we, we yeah. have uh, we have been able to um, show the different positions of the glasses, the traffic from inside and outside, and the various loads we have to accept. And based on that, combined with the requirements of energy savings, solar shading, um, and other factors that the glass may also have to deal with, you are able to get the right recommendations. And then it's also a question of the budget. But I would always recommend to use your local glass sales agencies uh, who are serving on a daily basis in the architecture and engineer's office to give you the right recommendations. Otherwise, you will be almost lost. Okay. That's it for the questions we gained. We have another question about, um, we've mentioned books. Which ones do you recommend? Yeah, where to start? Where to start? Um, where to start? Um, <laughs> for instance, I could recommend my own PhD, Croft, <laughs> Climate Related Optimized Facade Technologies, because it contains a reference list of the books that helped me mastering that PhD. It's a, oh, good, it's yeah. a good starting point. Yeah. Um, precisely. That is for, available for free, even if you're not interested in the topics I'm claiming here or talking about the facades for different climate zones. Go to the very end and look at the reference lists. These are the books that helped me and I would also consider as a good start. Um, many of them are already available in versions online either legal or illegally, that's up to you. Um, but your local libraries most likely also have access to that. The question comes, what's the, what's the title of your thesis? The title is International Facades Croft. But uh, the simpler way to do, Marcel, is uh, they go to Facade World and yeah. type the name Marcel Bilo, yeah. and then they will be able to find the link to the TU Delft library as an open access, and then be able to download it. Yeah. And when you're at that Facade World, you also will be able to find all the other books. We actually have a section books. And uh, in that one, you're on, also going to find Holger's PhD, who's here in this uh, audience uh, as well, for example, but also all the other um, publications which are mostly um, open accessible. Yeah, yeah. But recently, this this week, we have defended uh, the, Susanna Goshoni defended her PhD about biomimicry in facades. Yeah. The week before, Lisa Ramich from Eckersley O'Callaghan published a very nice book about facade and glass structures. She's the one who designs all the Apple stores worldwide um, with these huge structural use of glass. So therefore, there's a plethora of books we share online available as a document. Uh, so therefore, have a look at um, Facade World um, and also um, the books on BK to Delft. We can also maybe share a link, but um, yeah, and most likely also the next PhD's uh, book list at the very end is already the source. For instance, if you want to know more about 3D printing and facades and something like that, grab Holger's PhD and he has a list of three pages at the very end uh, who recommends, uh, will be the recommendation for further books in that direction. We come almost, yeah, perfect, super, yeah, precisely. Journals open to Delft, that's already one of them. We have one last question we can a we are able to tackle. Um, maybe Andre is over here. Is he or not? Let me check. 
under there. No, I don't think he's here. But um, there's this building in uh, Muscat, in the Oman, which mm -hmm. um, has a, um, a metal mesh covering the entire building, also illuminated during the night. And there was a question from Andre, very impressive, no doubt, also a costly material. Of course, if budget is not an issue, then great. I would imagine that a steel mesh must act nicely as a shading device, but also helps up a lot of heat. One forgets how much heat can be transferred into the building like this. This is why I assume the linkage is via perforated bridges and the airflow between screen and building. So what I can see from right now from the sketches and the pictures is, I have my doubt if a mesh covering the building is that yeah. much of an influence to the overall facade. I would not consider this as a um, double facade. Yeah. It's a decorative layer. We have seen uh, buildings here in the Netherlands who uses mesh perforated uh, in front of it, which is so open that the wind is able to blow through and therefore not yeah. impacting the overall heat gain. Yeah. I would, in this case, consider that the mesh itself has a slight performance or small performance as a sunshade, but not as a uh, not as a layer, layer that that as a second layer of a facade. And I'm pretty sure they also use that because of that. I copy myself. Um, no? Okay, so do you think that then the, the heat is not transferred from this electrical facade to the building itself? It's completely separated. Yeah, it's, That's it's, the answer, it's, right? It's, 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 maybe, it's maybe blocking 10, 20 percent. If, if, if it's not more. Yeah. yeah, but not more. Well, yeah. the pictures are taken at nighttime. So it's inside illuminated, so it could be, say, quite tight mesh. And then, uh, you know, Marcella, 50% openings, you already see everything, you already envision everything, so it may be more. So the number of uh, the numbers of uh, coverage of the mesh would be important for that, and that obviously then blocks off some of the heat. But I wouldn't call this an, an, uh, a double layer facade. Yeah. And also, it's mentioned in the text that this layer diffuses the heat. I have my doubts about that. I am pretty sure the sun shading uh, performance was not the main criteria of making the building like that. Yeah, I think. I would so. also close. I would also close a building way more than this. In a region like that, thirty percent of glass ratio is already enough to have a sufficient daylight uh, performance, and everything above is only creating problems. This is an almost a uh, hundred percent, uh, ninety percent transparent building. So therefore, I doubt if that's a good choice over there. I'd like to close our little session, but I would like to ask if there's a few more remaining questions we have um, from the audience to interact a little bit more. Otherwise, um, I'd like to. Um, uh, maybe Marcelli, we have maybe five minutes for the next slide yeah. since Olger is here. Yeah. It's actually the ah. building of Olger the, that he presented ah. to Simon that had so okay. many. I did like, know that he was going to be here, so I think maybe it's a good opportunity that he also could reply the question himself. Yeah, oh, perfect. Yeah. Let's move it to Dr. Olga. Olga, precisely. I have to say to all her that the, uh, the assignment had like a lot of interest from a lot of learners. So I'm very happy that you are here also to tell us a little bit more about the building and the facade system yourself. Yeah, uh, actually, um, it's a very public building in my uh, hometown where I'm at now. And uh, I'm also um, connected to heritage building construction. So therefore, I chose a uh, building from 1699 and uh, uh, funnily or remarkably, we can still apply most of the principles that we were discussing in the course also to very old buildings, only that uh, most of the time is low tech versus high tech and is more to the massive wall than to the transparent uh, glass palaces that we are building at the moment. So um, the question, uh, this building is very old, built in 1699, some 323 years ago. Considering that the facade stood the test of time, 323 years. I wonder if us after this course will be able to design anything better. What better proof of a good design an architect may expect than to see his her building facade fulfilling all the function it was designed for after 300 years. 
Uh, actually, it's a statement and um, uh, less a question. Yeah. So your yeah. Adam Boining was indeed a master builder. But actually, yeah, I mean, uh, a little bit the same direction. Uh, what kind of construction is it? It's a solid structure, I guess, yeah. bricks, plastered. Massive wall, yeah, exactly, with punched windows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we see in that sketch is that actually the punch window is um, positioned at the outer layer, mm -hmm. um, typical for that uh, time, also for building physics reasons, uh, which uh, means a uh, cold bridges are um, narrowed to the to the outside. But what we also see is there's some kind of insulation. Is this you assuming, or is this something which is to be added? It's just uh, the representing the, the uh, place of the insulation according to the sketch that we wanted to produce. So actually here, the massive wall will, will build up the, the, uh, the thermal mass that is needed to separate inside from outside. Yeah. But back in the days, the, the temperature uh, from uh, inside and outside was not in a, uh, uh, it wasn't, uh, it was colder inside and, and not as uh, heated up as today. So yeah, that's it works a, a, comment, a comment Marcel always comes with. So if you go say for the stick buildings, the timber stick buildings, all this kind of buildings, then it was accepted that you have in winter time 16 degree, not 20 at all places or 25 at all places to sit in a t-shirt. So you have to wear a jacket. So yeah. say dealing with different comforts, is, uh, was something which was obvious at that time. And um, yeah. in that respect, uh, the quality of the building could be different. Nowadays saying maybe lower, but you accept because it's say the state of the art and you adapt to it by yeah, wearing your jacket. So when we would fulfill North European building codes, um, that building type wouldn't work anymore. But um, uh, the, the, the common is right, um, it survived 300, uh, 300 years. The performance of the facade is a different one at that time expected than we expect now. But I mean, also you can see that uh, also old and used materials can stay much longer on a building than, than is usually uh, indicated by the codes or by the, by yeah. the but it is an, same with the IGUs. If you don't face a problem with the IGU, if it's not leaking, then you don't have to exchange it after 25 years. Some of them will last 50 years, no problem. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I guess we have to also develop a, a feeling or, or a, um, um, a way to, to deal with um, not um, brand new buildings every, every other year. So we have to expect and accept that buildings get older and there's a, like a usage to it and it still works. Yeah. So this is less a question than a comment. Yeah. Uh, we want to show another one from Holger's sketches and comments from others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will we will uh, switch to one one uh, here another slide, um, but then we also have to to close here. Yeah. Uh, Holger, yeah, this I'm... is a very interesting case studio. I wonder, does it combine new elements with traditional ones? No. Uh, in this case, no, because it's a, a monumental heritage building and it's open to the public as a museum. And uh, they try to keep everything as much uh, as it was 300 years ago, even if they're restored today. They would use traditional materials, traditional craft techniques to, to really restore and, and uh, reconfigure it as it was back then. So no, but uh, I mean, if I would transfer such a building today into a living for, for a family, then yes, you should combine sure. uh, old with new yeah. for sure. And it works, I mean, still it works. But you have to great. learn from the course and apply the, the knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Olga, super great that you are here actually to reply to solve the question. It was really, really nice. And just like one more question for uh, Professor Kanak. Uh, where is your screwdriver? <laughs> what is what? Where's your, your screwdriver? screwdriver? Mine. Mine? Your screwdriver. Mine, my oh, screwdriver. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Always be careful what you ask for. Uli, Uli shocked okay. a lot of people when he tried to rip something open, pray something. He always wants to break something when we were on tour. So therefore, it's uh, yeah, be, be careful with that. <laughs> so um, I hope we had been able to answer a couple of questions of your. We still hope you enjoy the content we have prepared and uh, the assignments uh, were not that difficult. You've been able to learn from that and um, still able to exchange the knowledge 
within the platform that is also our intention that you learn from each other that's sort of the setup of, of this um, you're facing the last two weeks there's a couple of more things to come still hope you all enjoyed it and um, we stay in contact uh, via various uh, social medias um, if there is no more burning question in general, then I would say thank you very much. This was a pleasure for me also having up to uh, yeah, 30 people here in the chat. I know Bea is also here and she's already mentioned if we have more than 15, it's already a huge success. So therefore, I'm very happy. Uh, <laughs> I'm very happy about that. We accomplished our goals. So therefore, it was a pleasure. Hope to see you at a certain point uh, in life, in real. Um, but uh, it's not that easy, I would say, to travel that far. But uh, there might be actually a second, um, a second uh, course where we might also explore other continents. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Thank you, guys. Thank right. you All very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye.